Welcome, everybody. Beautiful faces. Good to see you, too. It is truly an honor and a privilege every time uh, to get asked to come up here and, uh, and to um, come before God and uh, try, to, try to find what, um, what his words are and what he has and dig into Scripture and, and dig into our experience and, uh, and really just um, um, let my words try to be his words. And, um, boy, nothing will press you into God like that. You know, you might be going through your week and you're just kind of doing your week, you know, and, and you're always in, in communication with God. But when you're, you know you're going to get up here and you're actually going to speak from the pulpit, you press in a little harder, you know. So it really is a blessing. Does everybody have a bulletin? I know there's some good stuff on there. I want to uh, real quick give it up for our usher team who is just amazing. They're just like, looking at them back there, they're like ninjas, man. They just slip in and out. You don't even know what's going on. A, uh, such, such a blessing. Um, so we're still in our God Direction series. Um, that Pastor Andre and Pastor Timberley have been giving us some amazing and wonderful messages on it. And these are things that we, as a congregation, had questions on. And uh, we, we had some things that we're all going through. And I think it's unique in our church that our church says, what do you want to hear? Rather than just sitting together and going, hey, this is going to be the word. This is what we're going to teach this week. Um, not a lot of churches like that. I've, I've, I don't think I've ever been in a church where they asked me what they want, what we wanted them to preach on. Um, that's kind of a scary thing, right? Because because congregation could ask for all kinds of things, and some of those things are, are difficult subjects, and some churches don't want to attack those things. Uh, so anyway, I, I um, I'm grateful for that too. I'm grateful for our pastors, and I'm grateful for the word they've been given and, and the type of church that we have. Um, some of the questions were dealing with anxiety and depression. And our pastors have asked me to address these challenges. Um, so we're going to do a two-part message, and, and we'll be talking exclusively about dealing with depression in two weeks. I'm going to be gone next week, and Pastor Andre is going to be talking about cussing. And I actually should be here for that message. <laughs> so I'm sorry I'm going to be out of town and miss that one. Um, but uh, it's going to be awesome, I'm sure. And then I'll be back uh, the week after that to finish this series uh, on uh, this message, and that will, will be on depression exclusively. So today is, as Pastor Timberley was talking about, is going to be on anxiety and dealing with anxiety, and the title is called Anxious Faith. Um, because I, I kind of feel like sometimes that's a state that we all sort of live in as Christians. We live in anxious faith. You know, we believe, but there's a lot of things we're just not quite ready to give up to God yet. There's a lot of things we're still worried about, that we're still stressed about, that we don't know if he's going to take care of. We hear he's going to, we read that he's going to, we pray that he's going to, but we don't always believe that he's going to. And so it's, it is sort of an anxious faith. It sounds like an, an oxymoron, but um, I think that it's deeper than that. Um, I, the church sometimes takes a stance that feeling anxious or stressed or worried is what? It's a lack of faith, right? You just don't believe enough. If you believed enough, you wouldn't feel that way. Um, but that's not very realistic, is it? We're human beings. And we all feel that way. We can't all be doing it wrong, right? So, so that we need a little bit more than just you should believe or you wouldn't feel that way. You should believe or you wouldn't be stressed or worried. You wouldn't feel anxiety. And by the way, we all feel anxiety, don't we? We all deal with anxiety. There's not one person in here that doesn't. I've been mean, watching Taya sing this beautiful song. Um, I'm sure that she had a little anxiety before she came up here and sang. And you know what? Remember the first time she sang at the old building, uh, I don't know, a year, year and a half ago, however long it was, she had a lot more anxiety then, right? And, and one of the privileges of, for Gino and I being on the worship team is, is with so many young people watching them walk through their anxieties because they all had them. Some of them wouldn't open their mouths. They wouldn't sing at all. And you listen to them now and you just go, oh, my gosh, they're just amazing. They bless me every week. So um, there are different types of anxiety. Some of us deal with, you know, um, lost opportunities because of them. You know, we, we know we should have stepped up someplace, and we didn't. We had the opportunity, and it missed. We missed it because it went right by, and we were so full of anxiety about the results or what would happen that we didn't step out there. We have sleepless nights about all kinds of things, you know, stressed out days. Some of us deal with anxiety on a much deeper level. Some of it is medical anxiety. Sometimes it's, it's severe anxiety. And so we're going to talk about um, all the different types of anxiety um, that we deal with. And I want to start by letting you know that I, I am a bug doctor, but I'm not a doctor, okay? And, and I wish more pastors, when they speak about things like this, would qualify that and come from that humble perspective, see, because we're not doctors. 
And when pastors stand up here and say, you should get off your medication, you don't need that. That's, that does not just a disservice to the church because of the things that unfold from that, but it puts people in harm's way, doesn't it? See, God is bigger than our little box. So my understanding might be, well, God will give you all things. He will, but God will do it the way God wants to do it. And he might want you to go through a doctor. See, there might be something there. God doesn't just work in your life. He wants to work in your life in a way that will affect everyone around you. It will affect people you don't know yet. When you step out in your purpose and you do things you're supposed to do, you're going to find that all kinds of people are going to be affected by that, people you never anticipated. And there's going to be little miracles in their life, and it's going to spread through little miracles in other people's lives. So he doesn't need the doctor, but he'll use the doctor because the doctor's one of his sheep too, right? There's all kinds of blessings. I guarantee you, Miss Linda best blessed her doctors. I guarantee you she did. I guarantee your family did. I know for a fact my sister and, 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 and Pastor Ed did many, many times. I saw nurses in there while my sister was, was struggling with cancer, and nurses were kneeling by her crying, giving their testimony. Many of us saw that, right? So God works through all kinds of ways. So I'm not a doctor, and I'm not here to tell you to, to, uh, that you need to uh, get off medication or, or what you need to do. Unfortunately, there isn't an easy answer here. There really never is. God doesn't want to give you an easy answer. He doesn't want you to just go, okay, what do I do, Pastor Grady? Tell me what to do. I'm going to run off and do it, and I'm going to be happy, joyous, and free from now on. It doesn't work that way. We have to press into lots of different things, and prayer and getting before God is one of them. But he also is a God of relationships, isn't he? So he wants us to press into relationships, and you'll find that some of the things we're going to talk about today that um, Taya was referring to in the song are about those relationships. They're about the identification and the healing, especially with, with mental and emotional struggles that come from identification and relating to people, from getting honest and finding out you're not unique. You're not the only one that's going through that. As a matter of fact, everybody goes through it just at different levels. And we go through it at different levels at different times in our life. I have anxiety about my children. Now, today's a good day. I don't feel as anxious about them today. I can't promise what I'm going to feel like about them tomorrow, right? How many parents can relate to that? So we have different levels of anxiety. Sometimes at my job, I feel amazing. I, I know what I'm doing. They ask me the right questions. It seems like I'm on a roll. And there's other times I don't feel so good. I don't, I, I'm over my head. So, so anxiety can kind of come and go, can it? I feel like um, I, I kind of want to touch on this real quick, and I don't want to spend a lot of time on it, but um, kind of piggybacking on what I was just talking about, about pastors, sometimes not um, just, just kind of simplifying things and saying you don't believe enough, you have to have more faith. Um, pastors don't always have to have the answer. And sometimes I think that's where we go wrong in church. I, I really believe it's why the church is largely ineffective. I believe it's why we're so separated. Pastors feel like they... Um, if you come to them with a problem, they have to have the answer for you. There's almost a fear there of what if I don't? How can I be a leader? I must be doing something wrong. I have to have the answer for you. And in doing that, you inadvertently allow yourself to be placed on a pedestal as a pastor. And what happens is people take their eye off God and they put their eye on you. And how many churches do you see where you ask them, what's going on? How do you like that church? Oh, I love the pastor. He's really funny. He's really great. He tells great stories. Gives a great message. So who are they looking at as a whole? Are they looking at God or are they looking at their pastor? The pastor doesn't have to have the answers for you. Christ became the inner temple. You can go right to God now. Right? And it's important that we do that. So when we talk about these things here, it's not about the message. It's about, whoop, it's about um, seeking God. It's about you having that relationship. Your pastor should constantly be encouraging you to seek God for yourself. First, seek God for yourself. I'll walk with you. I'll share my experience, my strength, my hope. I'll help you in any way I can. But I encourage you to seek God yourself because he's going to give you the answer. Do you need to go to a doctor? Do you need to stay on medication? Do you need to go into therapy? Do you need to just talk to some people about what's going on in your life? Let's walk through that and talk about it, but let's seek God first because he's going to reveal it to you, right? He wants you to depend on him. More than anything, God wants to... The reason we talk about tithing so much and people who don't come to church or who struggle with that issue, hearing about money all the time, it's because they've missed the point of that. It's not about the money. And I'm sure there are churches where it is, but it's certainly not what God's referring to in Scripture. It's about, like Pastor Timberley said, it's about your heart. God wants a relationship with you. It's pretty hard to do that if your heart is already tied up in all your stuff, 
right? And if I can't separate myself from that stuff, then I can't give myself to God. And so that's what he's after there. Amen? So the answer to our question here about anxiety, um, it's always going to start by seeking him in prayer and meditation and scripture. And we talk about seeking God. You know, those are probably good places to start, right? Prayer, some meditation, meaning some alone time, whatever that means for you um, with God, and pressing into scripture, just picking up the Bible and trying to read it as much as you can. And I know young people struggle with that. But seek God in your own way. I mean, I encourage you to see. I, I can sit here and browbeat you to read the Bible. But you're, even if you read it, you're probably not going to be enjoying it. You're not going to be getting anything out of it. So I, what I encourage you to do is to seek God in your own way, right? Because God will convict you. That's the other thing is when we talk about pastors having to have the answers, it, it's, a, it, it's in itself a lack of faith in God. If I just love you like I'm commanded to do, if I just walk with you like I'm commanded to do, I know. I've seen it. You can't, it's not an argument for me anymore. I've watched people transform from unbelievable, profound degradation to, to the highest levels. I've watched that happen. I know it happens. I don't think it does. I know it does. And God did it. I didn't do it. None of their counselors did it. None of their therapists did it. A pastor didn't do it. God did it. So, so when I walk with you and I just say, I don't necessarily have the answers for you, but I'm going to walk with you, I know God's going to heal you. I know he is. So when we talk about seeking him first, um, it's, it's, it's about pursuing a relationship with him, but it's also about us walking with other people, trusting that God's got them. Amen? So we're going to talk a little bit about what the Bible actually says, and we're going to apply some experience as well and try to give some practical solutions for dealing with anxiety, you know, whether it's a severe case of anxiety that's, a, that's keeping you from what you feel is living a normal life or just a period you're going through, just some anxiety that you're feeling, and it's, it's stealing your joy. It's affecting your happiness. It's affecting um, your love, your love walk. Because one of the themes of this is anxiety will not only keep you from your purpose, and it absolutely will. We have some amazing young talent in here, some of these musicians. If they allow anxiety to get in their way, it will interfere with their purpose. They will not achieve their goals. Right? So they have to find ways to walk through that. So one of the things that affects is your purpose. And without purpose, life becomes pretty blasé, doesn't it? starts to get pretty black and white. You get up every day wondering what you're doing, why you're doing it, what's it all about. So you got to have purpose. Purpose is, is paramount. But it also affects your love. When you're full of anxiety, do you find that it's easy to love other people? When you're anxious about what's going on and you're stressed about what's going on, are you actually open to seeing that someone needs a hug, someone needs you to talk to them? Are you open to that? Is it easy to love then? No, because you're caught up in yourself, right? You're caught up in that anxiety. Let's look at a couple definitions of anxiety. This is... This is like Webster's. I don't know if it's Webster's anymore. We get it off the Internet, but, you know, dictionary.com, I guess. Distress, distress or uneasiness of mind caused by fear of danger or misfortune. So that's kind of a real anxiety, right? He felt anxiety about the possible loss of the job. Two, earnest but tense desire, eagerness, had a keen anxiety to succeed at his work. So sometimes we want something and we're worried we're not going to get it. And there's a psychiatric definition, which is a state of apprehension and psychic tension occurring in some forms of mental disorder. Anxiety can represent a lot of different conditions. Here's just a few, and you guys have heard most of these. Panic disorder, agoraphobia, uh, that's a fear of going outside. Social phobia, obsessive compulsive disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder, acute stress disorder, anxiety associated with medical conditions, things you're going through uh, health-wise, anxiety induced by substance intake, uh, generalized anxiety disorder, that's called GAD, and it's a mood disorder that is it's characterized by multiple or nonspecific worries that interfere with a person's life in some way. Multiple or nonspecific worries that interfere with your life, meaning there's a whole bunch of stuff you're worried about. They're not really specific. You can't put a finger on it. They don't even necessarily make sense, but they're interfering with your life. Interesting, um, the word anxious comes from the Greek, Greek verb merimneo, which means to be divided or distracted. I thought that was an interesting, because when we think, of, we think of anxiety, we just think of the emotion, the feeling. But the definition, divided or distracted, kind of drives it home a little, right? It's very difficult to focus on the things you want and to get anywhere in life when you're divided or distracted. In Latin, the same word is translated anxious, which implies choking or strangling. I thought that was interesting, too. It also appears in German as uh, um, nor, uh, uh, Marvin's probably going to, laugh at me for this if he ever hears it, but I think it's Vergen. Vergen. Does that sound like Marvin? Vergen. 
which translates uh, in English to worry. Anxiety translates to worry. So remember, Jesus talked about worry, too, in his parable of the sower in Mark 4. We don't need to go there, but you guys remember it. If you've, if you've been in the Bible for any amount of time, that parable, he mentions a seed being sown among thorns. And he's giving us an example of the real destructive power of anxiety. He said, other seed fell among the thorns, and the thorns came up and choked it, and it yielded no crop. Then later, when the disciples are asking him about the meaning of the parable, he interprets it in his own words. He says, regarding the seed thrown among the thorns, sown among the thorns, he explained, these are the ones who have heard the word, but the worries of the world and the deceitfulness of riches, desires for other things, enter in, choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. I think that kind of goes to the heart of really just the kind of basic anxiety that we all deal with. The worries of the world, things we want, whether we're going to get them, whether we're going to hang on to them, all that stuff. And you can see what he's talking about there. It chokes the word out. So all the stuff that God has for you, um, it's hard for you to hear it. Sometimes you feel it in worship, and I can see it on your faces. We, I, sometimes I feel it. I have things going on. And, and Gino is pressing us to release. He's saying, just sing it. Just open up and let it out, right? Just totally give yourself to that song, give yourself to God. And we fight it. We kind of resist it, right? We're looking around or, or we're just kind of singing, but we're not really singing. We're just not giving in. That's the same thing in a nutshell. That's like a microcosm of what we're talking about here. That anxiety comes in, the worries of the world and other things that are on our mind, and it keeps us from giving ourselves wholly to God. And if it keeps us from giving ourselves wholly to God, then guess what else? It keeps us from receiving wholly uh, from God as well. Scripture mentions um, anxiety as well, and it, and it kind of seems to give us that same answer we talked about before. In Psalm ninety four nineteen, it says, and I'm just going to go through these real quick because there's some other stuff I want to talk about. Uh, when, when anxiety was great within me, your consolation brought me joy. So this isn't just David telling us that God's love brought him peace. It also reminds us that we will have moments and times of anxiety, right? So the whole notion that if you're in anxiety and you have worry, you're not, you're not in faith, well, you know, here's David right here who absolutely was in faith. And as you read that story about him hiding in caves and, and trusting not to kill his enemy who was after him right when he was right there in front of him and, and uh, all the other parts of that story, you can see he was absolutely living in faith. But he says, when anxiety was great within me, your consolation your, brought me joy. So God is the answer. But we will as humans fall into anxiety and strife and worry. 1 Peter 5, 7 says, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. And this is just God's instruction for when you're feeling anxious, stressed, or worried. Cast it on him. So if it's that easy, how come so many of us struggle with it? How come we struggle with so many different types of anxiety? Is it really just as simple as having enough faith, just believing? See, here's the thing. And, and like I said before, a lot of you probably aren't going to like this, but it's going to be different for each of us. It's going to be different for everybody in here. God doesn't have you on the path that he has the person next to you on. That's how you know that God loves you and he has a purpose for you. You are on a different path than I am. And so your solutions to sometimes the same problems are going to be different. How wonderful is that? I mean, amen. How wonderful is that? That uh, <laughs> seven billion people on the planet and that each and every one of us have a different course and a different solution through God for the same problems. So there is no easy cut and dry answer. It means you have to seek him and you have to do a few other things. And, and there are a few things that are true for all of us. There's an old joke. It says, uh, how many psychiatrists does it take to screw in a light bulb? Only one, but the light bulb has to really want to change. <laughs> and that's the truth, right? Sometimes we just don't want to change. We like hang on to that stress and that pain and that worry because it just becomes so familiar to us. We just don't know how to live without it. We don't know how to move into a new season, into a new place. It reminds me of the story of the deaf man, a blind man, and a handicapped man. They heard that Jesus was on the mountain healing. So they rush right up there, and, and the deaf man goes up, and Jesus looks at him and touches him, and all of a sudden he can hear, and all the sounds of the world flush in, and his face lights up, and he reaches out and touches the blind man, and the blind man opens his eyes and sees for the first time, and he's just praising God, and Jesus turns to the handicapped man in the wheelchair and he says, what can I do for you, my son? He says, don't lay a finger on me. I'm on disability. Don't you touch me. We'll fight to hang on to our anxieties. Man, I've watched people, you know, on a serious note with that, I've watched people who hang on to that disability. They can't give it up. They'll, I got my check coming. There's healing. Sometimes they're better and they'll stay on that. 
They'll stay on it because they're hanging on to it. There's something they're afraid to press into the new season. Some people will say, well, they just don't want to work. Everybody likes to work. You just want to work at something you like. It's amazing. You'll say, oh, I'm so lazy. Well, you're not. I'd say to my kids all the time, they're not lazy when they want to beat a video game. <laughs> They'll stay there for hours, figure out every last little detail. Right? So we're not lazy. We just got to find our purpose. We got to find our lane. We got to find out where we're supposed to be. Right? Amen? So let's talk about um, some examples of what are typically called anxiety and see if you can relate to any of these. There's 10 examples here. I pulled these off the um, Psychiatric Association. Um, number 10 was misunderstood by others. How many of us have felt misunderstood? Feel like nobody can relate to our inner thoughts? Like, not just misunderstood, but my inner thoughts. Like, if you really knew what I thought, you probably wouldn't like me so much or you wouldn't accept me. We all have those inner thoughts. You know, the interesting thing is as you start to share and we start talking about this and you start really sharing those inner thoughts, and believe me, you know, I, I'm a recovering addict. I've got t about 25 years clean. Um, so I had to go through a huge process there. And in that process, now, of course, it's been years and years of counseling other people since then, but in that process... Trust me when I tell you, I had to share a lot of my innermost thoughts, things I didn't want to share with people. And um, when you do it, the first thing that shocks you, and anyone who's ever done this knows this to be true, is, wow, it's not as bad as I thought it was going to be. This person does feel the same way. They do have a lot of the same thoughts. They can relate. They don't look at me like I just sprouted another head. Number nine, restricted from living a normal life. We feel that our options in life are limited because of whatever our situation is, and we're unable to engage in common everyday activities that everyone else seems to do so well. I mean, sometimes that anxiety, we just sit there on the sideline, right? Pastor Ed used to say this all the time, the two kinds of people in the world, those that are on the field playing the game and those that are sitting in the stands watching. Sometimes we're sitting in the stands watching because we're afraid of what it's going to look like when we're on the field, what people are going to say about us, right? Number eight, we feel trapped. We realize our thoughts and actions don't make rational sense, but we feel doomed to repeat them anyway. Anybody re identify with that? We don't know any other way to handle these scenarios in our life. It's difficult for us to change our habits because we don't know how. We know our thinking doesn't make sense. We know these actions that we're doing don't make sense. It might be something like using drugs. It might be some other insane behavior, gambling, shopping, spending money you don't have just trapped in this stuff, and it causes all kinds of anxiety, doesn't it? Number seven is alienated. We feel alienated and isolated from our peers and families. We feel like we don't fit in because no one understands us, and I'm just reading off their site here. The more we think this way, the more isolated we become. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy, and we identify with the word loner. So how many of us have felt separate and like we don't identify with anyone that we just don't fit in? Six, hypersensitive to criticism and evaluation. We interpret things in a negative, skewed way. Everything that's said to us, like our brain's default position is irrational and negative. So anytime, even, even a minor misunderstanding can lead to a lengthy period of self-criticism. So some little thing happens and all of a sudden, oh, I'm terrible. I'm just a terrible person. Look at this thing that happened. I'm just a loser, right? Sometimes others even try to offer us advice and we take it the wrong way. They're just trying to offer us advice. They love us. They're not even, it's not even a big deal. They're just giving us a little bit of advice. And we kind of overreact, right? That's, that comes from that anxiety. That overreaction, that defensiveness comes from that anxiety. Number five is depression over perceived failures. I think we can all relate to that. You get depressed over things that you, you replay events over and over in our head, how we failed. And, and uh, we're certain that others notice not only that we failed, but they notice that we're feeling anxious about it and that we're kind of freaking out. They dislike us because of it. At least we feel they do. In reality, most people, they're just thinking about their own life. They're not really focused on your failures and your things as much as you may think. And the more you give into that thought process of anxiety, trust me, the more sensitive you're going to be to it. The more you're going to feel everybody's looking at you, the more you're going to feel that they're judging you and all of that. The more you give into that, the more you're going to feel that. And, and you'll spend time obsessing over it. me, going back and, and reliving events from our childhood sometimes that were uh, negative or that embarrassed us or um, offended us. Um, number four was dread and worry over upcoming events. Uh, we think about upcoming events too much and negatively predict the outcome. Um, worrying about the future, and this is, this is a big one here because there's a solution to this one that's one we can all grab hold of. Worrying about the future focuses our attention on what? 
usually if we're anxious, it focus, focuses your attention on, on your shortcomings. You know, when you're anxious about something that's coming up that you're going to do, that you're going to step out in, if you're thinking about your assets, you're not anxious. If you're thinking about how you're going to succeed at that, you're feeling good about it. You're looking forward to it. You know, I tell the kids this all the time when they sing. I'm like, you do love doing this, right? Because sometimes I have to ask them. They get so terrified. They're up here going, oh, my God, 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 oh, my God. I can't do it. I just, do I have to do this? 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 Really, that's how it looks. And, and I, have to, I ask them, I'm like, you do like doing it, right? You do look forward to doing it. Don't you like to sing? Isn't that why you came here? So, so tell me that's not stealing their joy. Tell me it's not getting in the way of their purpose. You, you see how that affects us? And it affects us all in so many different ways. Um, but absolutely, you know, we, we, uh, we, when we replay those things and we dread those things, it's all about our shortcomings. It's all about what we're going to mess up. It's all about what we can't do. And as we start to focus on positive things and live in the moment, which is the key, um, we start to see the solution. Number three, uncertainty, hesitation, lack of confidence. Um, usually when you're feeling anxious, you're, it's affecting your self-esteem. By the way, I've talked about this before. Self-esteem isn't something you can fake. You don't get to get up in the morning and say, I'm going to have self-esteem today. Today, I'm going to have some self-esteem. Self-esteem is built. You get up, you walk through the things you're supposed to do, and you do, a, you do one step here. And then you take another step there. And then you do another thing here. And over time, that little eye that sort of your personality inside watches you and goes, no, you're not so bad. You're all right. There's your self-esteem. You can't blow off everything you're supposed to do, lay in bed all day, not, not take any action, just not show up when you're supposed to show up, not uh, be there for people you know you're supposed to be, and then expect to have self-esteem. It's not going to happen. Number two is fear of being the center of attention, uh, being put on the spot or made the center of attention, uh, and, and that kind of goes in line with some of the other stuff we talked about. And number one, and I think this goes to the key of anxiety, and that is self-conscious. Anxiety make us, makes us too aware of what we're doing and how we're acting around others. We feel like we're under a microscope and everyone is judging us negatively. As a result, we pay too much attention to ourselves. We worry about everyone seeming to observe and notice us. We worry about what we say, how we look, how we move. As an extreme example, we may even worry about the way we're walking. And we may think to ourselves, do I look funny? Am I walking strangely? Do I walk with a limp? Do I look like a small chimpanzee? Why is everyone looking at me? We're so obsessed with how we're perceived. So it's hard for us to focus externally and live in the moment and enjoy life. It's all about living in the moment. So, so for, for most of the anxiety that we experience, one of the things, because I really believe that at the core of this, whether it's something you deal with on a deep acute level that you struggle with medically, or it's just the anxieties that come up that are hindering you in your life. It comes from a self-focus, from a self-centeredness. And, and I know that, um, I mean, let me put it like this. If, you, if we spent more time thinking about how others are feeling, what others need, how we can be there for others, do you think our anxiety level goes down? Yeah. I mean, if you're thinking about other people and how you can help them and what's going on in their life and how you can be there for them and, and, um, and loving them, you're not going to feel anxious. Right? So it's when the focus shifts back to me, that's when the anxiety starts to build. Right? And so no matter what type of anxiety we're dealing with, I, I believe that's at the crux. Um, and the term self-centered has a pretty negative connotation in our society. It's almost like calling someone a jerk. Say you're self-centered, it's like calling them a jerk. But sometimes um, self-centered, self-focused thoughts and behavior can be the result of some pretty deep-seated issues. Right? Some of those things that we stress about and we focus on ourselves about are a result of things that maybe happened to us in our childhood. Traumas that we have, disconnects. Sometimes it's chemical imbalances. It can be all kinds of different things. So here's a key, and we're going to talk about some real practical things that, that we can do to work through anxiety. Having a relationship with our pastors, our ministers, our family members, our friends, ones that we can really open up to. It's important that when you come to church that you don't just... Listen to the word of your pastor and not come up and say, hey, and give them a hug. Not only because they may need it, and sometimes they do. Just because they're pastors or leaders doesn't mean they don't feel anxiety and stress and that they don't need a, a, a kind word and a hug as well for all the hard work they do. But it also starts to open a door so that you, you can't expect that when the, the world is crashing down around you and you're feeling anxiety, to be able to walk up to somebody and go, hey, let me pour all this on you. I know I don't know you, and we've never talked. 
but you know, let me give you all this. It takes some time. You have to work at that, right? So that's where we start. We start with those relationships because that's where you're going to start to get to the root of whatever is bringing you anxiety. And it's all about getting to the root, right? It's all about getting to the root and pulling that up. Because if you just deal with the superficial stuff, it'll be back. And it'll affect you in ways you don't even know it's affecting you. I wake up sometimes and realize I've missed a bunch of opportunities because of I'm caught somewhere else that I'm not supposed to be. A lot of people who struggle with anxiety have been told these things many, many times. All the stuff I've talked about, they've been told. And, they, and, and sometimes, as a matter of fact, when we talk about you need to have more faith and that kind of stuff, it, it actually makes things worse, right? Because then they feel like it's their fault. So it's really important that you can just open it up on an identification level without judgment. And I say that because when someone approaches you to talk to you, do not feel like you have to have the answer. You do not have to have the answer. And sometimes when we give the answer or we give what we think is the answer for their life, which is pretty glib and arrogant to begin with, for me to assume that I have the answer for your life off the cuff. But it, it also makes it worse. They start feeling judged. They feel like, well, I've heard that already. That isn't helping me, so it must be me. And they struggle more. So you didn't help at all. All you did was serve your own purpose of feeling good about yourself and telling that person what to do. And then we walk away telling ourselves we're such a good person because we listen to them and we help them. But did we help them? It's sort of like when a waiter comes up and he works his butt off and he brings you steak and all these different things, but you didn't order that. I mean, he could have done a great job. If it's not what I ordered, it's not, it's not going to make me happy, right? Just listen to the order. And so listening sometimes and just being there for people is, is really, really important. Um, starting those relationships and starting to open up to people that we trust you're going to see that you're not so unique. You're going to see that many people have been through the same things. And when you get to the root of some of this stuff, a lot of times God will reveal that you might need more help. That could happen. Sometimes it's, it, you will talk about these things, and they could be small issues, and you talk to someone, and you feel better, and you go, yeah, that is what it is. But sometimes there's something deeper. There's some stuff you really need to get to, and you might need some additional help. And um, sometimes it, it's, it's supplementing prayer and faith with therapy or medical treatment. It might be those things. It might just be pressing into relationships and opening up. But I, I believe that when you pursue that, God, not the person around you, but God will reveal what you're supposed to do. So I'm just going to recap a quick list of, of some solutions for anxiety. Number one, and you could write this down or not, um, but if you're struggling with anxiety, you might want to. Um, Number one, seek answers from God through extra prayer and time with him. Notice the word extra. So whatever you're doing, do more of it. Whatever that means to you, whatever that time with God means. Number two, watch your thoughts and your words. Thoughts become words, words become actions, and actions become reality. They become your character. They become who you are. They become your life, right? So don't allow self-demeaning thoughts and words to dominate your mind in conversation. Speak positive for positive results. Remind yourself of this constantly. Remind yourself. I tell the, the kids on the worship team this all the time because I hear them say it all the time, oh, I'm so terrible. I, I suck. <laughs> I'm no good at that. I can't do that. And by saying that over and over again, you don't think you're making it a reality? Of course you are. Of course you are. Watch your thoughts and your words. Number three, stay in the moment. Yesterday is gone, and tomorrow is not promised. I could walk out of here and get hit by a bus. I pray that I won't, but I could. Right? It's not promised. Our anxiety is lessened considerably when we live in the moment. Remind yourself constantly to do this, because it's hard to do. When I quit smoking cigarettes, I don't know, 24 years ago or something, I, I quit. I'm, I'm quitting. I'm just going to finish this carton first. <laughs> That, that really makes sense, right? That's that I just got to finish because I paid for it. You know, I, I'm going to finish it. But I, I really want to quit because they're killing me, and I don't want to do it anymore. But clearly I didn't. I, so I, I thought about how ludicrous that was, and I took the carton and threw it in the trash. I was like, how stupid is that? I'm going to hang on to these when I really want to quit just because I paid for them. And immediately they started calling me from the trash. <laughs> they were like, come get me. Come save me. Come smoke me. Right? And then every five minutes, have a cigarette. No. Have a cigarette. Have a cigarette. It's like that. That's what the renewing of the mind that Scripture talks about is. It's constantly reminding yourself over and over and over when you want to change, and that's what it takes. So remind yourself to stay in the moment. Remind yourself about your words and your thoughts, and remind yourself to stay in the moment. When you start worrying about something, is it here? You don't even know what's going to happen. How many, times have, how many people have worried about something that never even came to pass? Every hand should go up. So that was time well spent, huh? <laughs> Number four, keep moving. 
Anxiety causes us to freeze, right? It puts us in this place of just feeling like we just can't do anything. We just get immobilized by it. So just taking small, simple steps, like I said before, sometimes is the way out of being overwhelmed with anxiety. Just do one thing. Hey, it might just be getting up and brushing your teeth, right? And then go to the next thing and go to the next thing. If you're dealing with acute anxiety, it is about small steps. Don't try to go make some giant step. And by the way, if you're dealing with acute anxiety, don't make major decisions without involving people that you love and that love you. Don't say, you know what? I listen to Pastor Grady, and I just think I got it now, and I'm just going to drop my meds. <laughs> don't do that. Don't drop your medication based on that. Go talk to your doctor. Talk to some people in your life that you trust. Make those decisions with other people. Take small steps. Small steps are always better. By the way, small steps get you to the top of the mountain. Anybody ever climb I mean, We were doing this yesterday. We were on the slope. And when you take big steps on the slope, what happens? What happens, Divya? <laughs> we go tumbling down the mountain, right? And you take big steps on an icy slope, you fall. And you slide down. Usually about 10, you're about 10 feet behind where you were. When you take little steps, you get all the way to the top. Well, that's true in life. Little, little steps are real. Little steps in relationships are real. You can't just jump, walk up to somebody and say, you know, I really like you. I want to be friends. And then we're just going to be best friends and go hang out from then on, right? It's not like that. It takes small steps. Everything in life is like that. Anything you want to be successful at, and if it's going to be real, it's got to be small steps first. Number five. Be other-oriented. Focus less on ourselves and more on serving others. Loving them, being there for them, it takes the scrutiny and the pressure off of us. And it allows us to be full of purpose. And this increases self-worth and it decreases anxiety. So take the pressure off yourself. Focus on other people a little bit. Be there for other people. Six, build relationships. And that follows right in that vein, doesn't it? So when you focus on other people and you start being there for other people, you'll find you'll build relationships. You know, just go build a relationship. You ever notice when people, there's been periods in my life where people don't want to talk to me. It's like I, I walk up and people go, hey, how's it going? And they kind of all walk away. Well, that's because I've been kind of self-centered in those moments. My life's about me. And people are people. They may love me, but they still get tired of talking to me because it's all about me. Right? So how people react to you is absolutely a reflection of how you are. You can blame everybody else, but the truth is they're just reacting to you and how you are. You don't have to be the most fun person in the world. I don't have to be the life of the party. If I say, hey, how are you? How's it going with you? What happened with that thing you were doing? Watch how fast the conversation takes place. Watch how fast that person wants to walk up and talk to you the next time. So being other-oriented leads right into that step of building relationships. And in that, you start to find people that you can open up to. Right? And by doing this, we'll get to the root of our anxieties. You start opening up to people and you start sharing things. And you purpose to share those things. You're going to start to find out why you're feeling anxiety. God's going to reveal it. He wants to reveal it through someone else. Because what we talked about before, it's not just about me. It's about everybody. Right? And He wants those miracles in everybody's life. And then uh, number seven, don't be afraid to seek help if you're still overwhelmed. Don't, don't buy into that whole thing that there's something wrong with you and you just don't have enough faith. Go seek help. Might be a therapist. He works through God's working through uh, uh, doctors right now. He's working through therapists and counselors right, right, right now as we sit here. This next part, and I'm going to wrap it up here pretty quick because I know we want to we move into communion, but this next part is, is for all of us. When you're struggling with this stuff or not, and we talk about this a lot, but this, this is the thing that I believe a, a church service should be focused on every single week because we were only given two commands, remember? Love God and love each other. Christ said those supersede all other commands. In fact, he said the whole law can be summed up in those things. And how many of us need some help in loving God? How many of us need some help in loving each other? So every service should kind of center around that in some way or another. The message should always come back to that in some way or another. Check this out. Proverbs 12.25 Anxiety weighs down the heart, but a kind word cheers it up. A kind word. I mean, where do you suppose the kind word is supposed to come from? Is it supposed to come from the mountaintop in a booming voice like Charlton Heston's? Or is it supposed to be from you and me? The kind word is supposed to come from you and me. Reminding someone that they don't have enough faith will not lift someone's heart. Right? Encouraging them will. Walking with them will. Just listening to them, being their friend. and love them. It's not my job to tell you where you're falling short. It's my job to love you and to walk with you and encourage you to get closer to God. 
2 Corinthians 13, 11. Finally, brothers and sisters, rejoice. Strive for full restoration. Encourage one another. Be of one mind. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. That verse Thessalonians 5, 11. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up. Just, in fact, as you are doing. You know, we know these things. We hear these things. But we don't always feel like helping people, do we? Sometimes we just don't feel like doing it. We get caught up in ourselves. And we don't feel like being there for people. Gabe and I were at the gym the other day and we were in the steam room and uh, this woman came in and she was just had back surgery um, but she was really, really heavy and barely moving. She wasn't moving very well at all. And she came in and got to get up these steps. And I'm sitting right here and she comes right up here and she starts to get up these steps and as she gets one step up, she's wearing a little bathing suit, by the way, so there's a lot of skin showing and it's hot in there and she's, like I said, she's really struggling. And she starts to fall back and right away in my mind, I'm thinking, oh no. <laughs> Because there's only one way to grab her. There's only one way. You know what? I just didn't want to. I didn't want to do it. I didn't want to grab her and help her up. Sometimes we don't want to be there for people. And the, the truth is, as we talked to her, we found out that she just had back surgery. We had a blessed conversation, and we went on to talk for, for quite a while after that. Um, but, you know, for a minute there, it was, it was, it was kind, of, kind of sketchy. I keep hearing these reminders that we shouldn't waste our time on people who don't want to change, too. That's another one. If you guys see those, you see all the memes and stuff. And don't waste your time on people who don't want to change. That's true. But I have to caution you to be really careful who you write off. Sometimes they do want to change. They just don't know how. Those deep-seated issues we were talking about, they just have them trapped. And I personally watch absolute miracles in people who struggled for years that everyone else had written off. I've had the honor of being the one person that didn't write them off and watched them change and got to feel that. And it's a great feeling when you stick with someone who no one else stuck with and they they get it and they change and their life just goes on to bless so many other people. I've also had the shame of giving up on someone who someone else didn't and they made it. But I gave up on them. That's not a good feeling at all. I've experienced the devastation of knowing people who have taken their own life. Many people. Because we all gave up on them. Anxiety and depression, it's not just always a small thing. Just because you understand anxiety as something where you're just a little stressed about your kids and your job and those things doesn't mean the person next to you who comes with every week is struggling with something that's superficial and small. To them, it's overwhelming. To them, it could end their life. It could go out and end their life today. So it's something that as Christians, we're called to love each other. And that means not when it's easy, not when it's just convenient, but when it's hard. Love is patient, right? We read that over and over. But it can't be patient unless someone tries your patience. (laughs) How is love patient if they're easy? That's implying that they're impatient. It's implying that they're difficult. Love is kind. It can't be kind unless they need it. Man, you walk up to somebody and they're smiling and they got joy on their face and it's, they're just beaming and everything's good in their life. That's probably not the person who's going to benefit from that kindness. That's the one you probably don't want to talk to because you don't want to have that downer conversation. And of course, love never fails. Never. Never fails. Doesn't mean that person is beyond our love because they don't want it or they can't change. Love never fails. That means I don't need to get in the way and give you the answers. I just need to love you and let God do it. He'll convict you. He'll show you where you need to go. Why do I need to tell you that homosexuality is a sin? Why do I need to tell you that? If all sin is equal, then I'm sinning too. Every day. So why do I feel necessary to say, well, homosexuality is a sin? Why? Why can't I just say, hey, brother, you know what? That's between you and God. I know what I read and what it says to me, but that's just to me. Hey, listen, if everybody agrees, we said, well, the Bible says this, and I know I'm going on a tangent, I'm probably going to go a minute long, but I'm feeling it. If I feel like what I see in the Bible is the truth, then why are we so divided? Why are there hundreds of denominations? Why was there a great schism? Those people knew more, they forgot more about the Bible than you and I know. They were living in those times. So why were they fighting? If it says that, and that's what it says, and that's absolutely what it means, well, then why are they fighting? Why are they disagreeing? It means something different to you than it means to me. So, brother, you may be struggling with homosexuality. That's not for me to judge. That's between you and God. I'll tell you what, I love you. Come in here, man. Let's worship together. Let's get down on our knees and let's pray. I'll walk with you, man. And I know one thing for sure. 
God will tell you the answer. He will tell you what you need to do. I, I don't have that answer for you. But I love you. you. You think anybody has ever decided that they were going to give up homosexuality because you told them it was a sin? It's not for me to decide. And so it's not for me to decide about any of these things in your life. It's for me to love you. And my plate is full doing that. I have to confess, it's not an accident that I'm giving this message today. I mean, I know a lot about anxiety and depression. I've counseled people for many, many years. But I've been filled with anxiety lately. I've, I've been, it's, it's affected my ability to love. It's affected my purpose. I've been filled with anxiety about my job. We bought out by another company and I have 25 years. I'm the best in my field at what I do and now I'm in a completely different field and I don't know what I'm doing. Think there's going to be anxiety there? Absolutely. I don't even know if I can do it. I got anxiety there. My worth is affected by that, especially as a man. We associate so much of our identity with what we do. I've been filled with anxiety about whether or not I'll be a good dad and role model, not only for my own kids, but for my sister's beautiful kids. After all the years that I watched them give that incredible love and example to those kids, am I going to screw it up? I have anxiety about that. Or whether I can provide financially for their happiness, not just right now, but for their futures. Anxiety about my business, my side business, this dream I have, what I'm supposed to be doing. And this dream is about helping other people. How am I going to do that? I know you gave it to me, God, but I'm not seeing it. I don't know where to go. I don't know what to do whether I'll be able to use the gifts I know God's given me. He's given me lots and lots of gifts. I've been blessed with many, many gifts, most of which I have underachieved at in my life. I think many of us can say that, because we're all given so much. I've underachieved, mostly because of focusing on myself. Feeling like, am I just going to be trapped in this grind on this little hamster wheel, just doing something I have to to pay the bills? How many can relate to that? That's one that's been on me. And so I've been filled with this anxiety and it's affected how I love my beautiful wife in our relationship daily. Um, the kids that are in my life, um, our family, our kids, I find myself like a drill sergeant just going through the motions because we got stuff that's got to get done, man. There's a lot going on. There's a lot of people in our house. And I forget to just love individually and be there for each and every one of them every time because of that anxiety. Um, it's funny, and Norca can't be here today, but I was thinking about the other day, she said to me, and I'm so privileged to work with the kids we have on the worship team, they bless me so much. And when I get full of anxiety, whether it's just trying to get the service ready in the morning or practice on a Thursday or just any other time, I forget to just take the time to love them individually. And, um, and Norca said to me the other day, she goes, you're so mean to me. I thought... <laughs> You're just being too sensitive. And then later I thought, I, I was short with her. I was mean with her. I love her. She's beautiful. She's amazing. Like, how could I have done that? You know, and it, it really makes you stop and think. So I, um, I think it's one of those things that a, a lot of us can probably relate to. Um, most of that stuff, you know, is me not with it in the moment, right? We're about what's going to happen. Not what's here right now. Focus on me, whether I'm going to provide, whether I'm going to be good enough, not focus on my amazing wife and all the things she does, be there for her. Amazing how that will relieve some anxiety, especially if you want, you know, if you want her to give you a kiss. <laughs> I'm not going to want to do that if you're all anxious and you're not giving her that love, right? So, all the things we talked about, you know, I am. Um, when I feel with anxiety, my relationships suffer. Those ones that I trust, the people that I have close in my life, I don't go to as much I isolate, I start feeling alone. I'm just overwhelmed, I feel like I got nobody I can talk to. Don't you feel that way sometimes? So real quick before we go to communion and prepare for communion, let's just all, you know, just um, just close your eyes and let's just pray.